Good afternoon. Welcome to the Institute of Politics. It is altogether fitting that we should be meeting in the library here at the Quad Club because our guest today has written some of the really incisive uh, books uh, that describe the current uh, condition of our, um, our, our economy, our society, uh, and global affairs. So uh, this is the proper setting uh, for this discussion. I, um, I will only say this about him because we have someone who will give a, a fuller introduction that um, there are a few people in this country who you would describe as public intellectuals, who people look to for guidance and for direction uh, in complicated times. And uh, Tom Friedman has been that person for a couple of decades. Uh, many of you probably read his, uh, his column in the New York Times. Many of you have read his books. Hopefully all of you will read the one that's on sale down there. Uh, but uh, I feel very fortunate to call him my friend and very fortunate to have him here today and to, um, to, to fill in the introduction. I want to introduce Nicole Beckman Tessel, uh, who is a, a PhD student in history. So you, you were a student here, an undergrad here as well. Was, yeah. yeah, she said she's a seventh year. <laughs> so that's hardcore. Uh, Nicole. Uh, I'm happy to welcome Thomas Friedman to the University of Chicago. Friedman is a foreign affairs columnist for the New York Times, as you all know, a three-time Pulitzer Prize winner in 1983, 88, and 2002, the best-selling author of eminently readable and compelling books about complicated matters. Among these books is his The World is Flat, first published in 2005, which established Friedman as a leading expert on globalization. Friedman has also written extensively on power, the environment, and American politics. Known for his indefatigable efforts to understand and then evaluate what he aptly describes as our interdependent world, Friedman is here to discuss with us his latest insights particularly those put forth in his most recent book, published late last year, entitled, Thank You for Being Late, An Optimist's Guide to Thriving in the Age of Accelerations. We're especially fortunate to have Friedman with us today, the eternal optimist, as we look toward the future on this icy, cold, early January 2017 day. Please join me in welcoming him. Just ask you to silence your cell phones, and when we go to questions and answers, make sure that you actually have questions. Thank you. Well, Nicole, thank you very much. Uh, David, thank you. It's a treat to be here, and um, I, uh, I'm going to talk for the next 30, 40 minutes about uh, my new book, and then open it up for questions. And um, uh, we've got books downstairs. If anyone wants to buy one, I'll stick around and sign them. Uh, I always begin by starting with the title of the book. People ask me where from comes the title, Thank You for Being Late. Uh, and the title actually comes from meeting people in Washington, D.C. for breakfast over the years, um, in, including in his previous life, David Axelrod. And um, every once in a while, someone would come 15, 20 minutes late. And uh, they say, Tom, I'm really sorry. Is the weather, the traffic, the subway, the dog ate my homework? And um, uh, one morning, three years ago, when uh, Peter Corsell, an energy um, entrepreneur, came late, I just spontaneously said to him, actually, Peter, thank you for being late. Because you were late, I've been eavesdropping on their conversation. <laughs> Fascinating. I've been people watching the lobby. Fantastic. <laughs> and best of all, I just connected two ideas I've been struggling with for a month. So thank you for being late. Well, people started to get into it. They'd say, well, well, well you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> because they understood I was giving them permission to pause, to slow down, to reflect. In fact, my favorite quote in the 
first chapter of the book is from my teacher and friend, Dove Seidman, who says, when you press the pause button on a computer, it stops. But when you press the pause button on a human being, it starts. That's when it starts to reflect, to rethink, and reimagine. And the argument of this book is, boy, we need to do a lot of that right now. Now, the book actually was triggered when I paused to engage with someone I wouldn't normally engage with. I live in Bethesda, Maryland, and I take the subway to work in Washington, DC, when it's running, about once a week. And uh, for me, that involves driving from my home in Bethesda on Bradley Boulevard to the Bethesda Hyatt, and I park in the public parking garage there. And I take the red line into DC, and I did that, low some three years ago now. Went into DC, came back at the end of the day, on the red line, got my car from the public parking garage, had my time stamp ticket, drove up to the cashier's booth, handed it to the cashier. He looked at it and looked at me and said, I know who you are. <laughs> I said, great. Uh, he said, I read your column. I said, great. Uh, he said, I don't always agree. I thought, get me out of here. Um, <laughs> but I said, um, uh, actually, that's good. It means you always have to check. And I drove off. So uh, a week later, I took my weekly subway ride in, uh, into DC, red line, office, back home, red line, car, timestamp ticket, cashier's booth, same guys there. This time he says, Mr. Friedman, I have my own blog. Would you read my blog? <laughs> I thought, oh my god, the parking guy is now my competitor. <laughs> what just happened? So I said, well, write it down for me, and I'll look it up. So he wrote down, he tore off a piece of receipt paper and wrote on it, odenambi.com. And I took it home. I called it up on my computer. It turned out he's Ethiopian, writes about Ethiopian politics. He's from the Oromo people, and a real democracy advocate. Uh, I thought about him for a couple days, talked about it with my wife, and I eventually decided that this was a sign from God that I should pause and engage this guy. But I didn't have his uh, email, so the only thing I could do was park in the parking garage every day, uh, which I did. And after four days, we overlapped. Uh, I parked my car into the gate so it couldn't come down. And I said, Ayile, now I know his name, Ayile Bougia. Uh, I would like your email, uh, which he gladly gave to me. And that night, I began an email exchange with him, which I repeat in the front of the book. Some of them are quite funny, are back and forth, uh, that I basically said, I have a proposition for you. I will teach you how to write a column if you will tell me your life story. And he basically said, I see you're proposing a deal. I like this deal. <laughs> so he asked that we meet near his office at Pete's Coffee House in Bethesda, uh, which we arranged to do uh, two weeks later. And I came with a six-page memo on how to write a column. Um, uh, some of it I've thought about before, and some of it I just did for this occasion. And he came with his life story. Uh, Ethiopian immigrant, uh, democracy advocate, got thrown out of the country 10 years ago, was a political exile in America, was um, blogging on Ethiopian websites, but they weren't fast enough. So he decided to start his own blog. And now, Mr. Friedman, I feel empowered. His Google metrics say he's read in 30 countries. This is my parking guy. Uh, and it's a great story about how anybody can participate today in the global conversation. And he's a wonderful man, and we've become friends, and as I say, a terrific democracy advocate for his own country. Well, I then explained to him how to write a column. Uh, if the world is a big data problem, this is my algorithm. I explained to him that a news story is meant to inform. I could write a news story about this event that would inform better or worse. Uh, but a column is meant to provoke. So I'm either in the heating business or the lighting business. That's uh, what I do. I either do heating or lighting. I'm either stoking up an emotion in you, or I'm illuminating something for you. And ideally, I do both, and I produce either heat or light, or both. But to create heat or light requires a chemical reaction. And you have to combine three substances. The first is, what is your value set? What do you stand for? What are you promoting? 
Are you a communist, a capitalist, a neocon, a neoliberal, libertarian, a Keynesian, a Marxist? What are the set of values you're trying to push into the world? Second, how do you think the machine works? So the machine is my shorthand for what are the biggest forces shaping more things in more places in more ways on more days? Because as a columnist, I'm always carrying around in my head a working hypothesis, always being updated, about how the main gears and pulleys of the world work. Because what I'm trying to do as a columnist is take my value set and push the machine. And if I don't know how it works, I either won't push it or I'll push it in the wrong direction. And lastly, what have you learned about people and culture? Because there's no column without people, and there are no people without culture. How does the machine affect people and culture, and how do they come back and impact the machine? Stir those three together, let it rise, and bake for 45 minutes. And if you do it right, you'll produce a column that produces heat or light. You'll know you've done that by the reaction readers give you. They might say, I never knew that. That's a good reaction. You produce some light. I never connected those things. That's a good reaction. I never looked at it that way. That's a good reaction. Your favorite, you'll live for this, happens four times a year. You said exactly what I felt, but didn't know how to say. God, God bless you. God bless you. <laughs> I want to kill you dead, you and all your offspring. I get that. That tells you uh, you've produced heat, OK? Any one of those reactions will tell you you've written a successful column. Well, the more I explained this to Ayili, the more I started to step back and say, I've been doing this, I've been a columnist for 22 years. What's my value set? Where did it come from? Because as readers of my column know, I'm not, not really, I'm not quite a liberal. Um, I'm a radical free trader and a super capitalist, actually. But I'm certainly not a conservative either. And that's because my values actually did not emerge from a library or philosopher. They emerged from the small town in Minnesota where I grew up in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. I grew up in a time and place where politics worked and it had a huge impact on me. How do I think the machine works today? And what if I learned all these years about people and culture? And I decided that was the book I wanted to write. And that's what this book is about. That's the journey. So let me begin by sort of breaking the book into two parts. The first half is about how the machine works. And the second half is about how it is reshaping the world in five realms, politics, geopolitics, ethics, the workplace, and community. So I think um, what describes the machine today is that we are in the middle of three nonlinear accelerations in the three largest forces on the planet, which I call the market, Mother Nature, and Moore's Law. I believe that's what is driving more things in more places, in more ways, on more days. So Mother Nature for me is climate change, biodiversity loss, and population growth. If you put it on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. The market for me is digital globalization, not your grandfather's globalization. That was containers on ships. That's actually going down. No, this is everything being digitized, whether it's MOOCs at the University of Chicago or Facebook or Twitter or PayPal, and now being globalized. And that is what's driving the world from interconnected to interdependent. That's the driver of globalization today. And Moore's Law, coined by Gordon Moore in 1965, the co-founder of Intel, posited that the speed and power of microchips would double roughly every 24 months. It's now closer to 30 months. But lo and behold, that exponential is held up for 52 years. Put it on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. We're, in fact, in the middle of three nonlinear exponential hockey stick accelerations in the three largest forces on the planet all at the same time. And they're all interacting with one another. More Moore's law drives more globalization. More globalization drives more climate change and more solutions as well. So let me talk about just one of them in the time we have. We can get into the others in the Q&A. Uh, and that is the exponential of Moore's law, because it's really the driver of all technology. 
and really the Uber driver of all of this. You know, one of the hardest things to explain to people is actually an exponential, because you rarely encounter one in your daily life. Uh, where you encounter it is when you're merging onto the freeway and go from zero to 60. That's when you feel velocity and acceleration both kicking in at the same time. The team at Intel, to give people just a feel for the power of something doubling and doubling and doubling and doubling. They once took a 1971 VW Beetle over at Intel, and they said, what if this VW Beetle improved at the same rate of microchips over the last 52 years? They determined that that VW Beetle today would go 300,000 miles an hour, it would get 2 million miles per gallon, and it would cost 4 cents you'd be able to drive the car your entire life on one tank of gas. That's the power of the exponential we're now in the middle of. Now my chapter on Moore's Law begins with the question and is so titled, what the hell happened in 2007? 2007? What's this guy talking about? Such an innocuous year. I was on Stephen Colbert last night, and they told me, it's not innocuous here. That was the year Stephen Colbert ran for president. Um, <laughs> uh, but actually, 2007 will be remembered for something else. Uh, 2007 began in January of that year at the Moscone Center in San Francisco when Steve Jobs unveiled the first iPhone, beginning a process by which we are now putting in the hands of halfway to all the people on the planet, a handheld computer connected to the internet with more computing power than the Apollo space mission. But that was just 2007 clearing its throat. In 2007, a company called Facebook, actually late 2006, opened its platform up to anyone with a registered email address and broke out of colleges and universities and went global. In 2007, a company called Twitter split off on its own independent platform and went global. In 2007, the most important software you've never heard of, called Hadoop, uh, named after the founder's son's toy elephant, uh, launched itself into the wild. Uh, Hadoop basically is the software that allows us to take a million computers and make them operate like one. Uh, that's called big data. That happened in 2007. The guys at Hadoop, Doug Cutting, the founder, didn't actually invent it. It was actually all invented by Google. But as Doug explained to me in the book, Google lives in the future and sends us letters back home. Um, and what Google did basically was leave a trail of breadcrumbs so the open source community could reverse engineer what Google did uh, and basically gave the world the big data revolution. But 2007 was still just clearing its throat. In 2007, Google bought a little-known TV company called YouTube, and Google launched into the wild an operating system called Android. In 2007, this guy up in Seattle named Jeff Bezos gave the world the first e-book reader called the Kindle. In 2007, IBM started the world's first cognitive computer called Watson. In 2007, three design students in San Francisco were attending the design conference. And they noticed all the hotel rooms were booked. And they happened to have three spare air mattresses that they thought would be cool to rent out, which they did. And it was so cool, they started a company called Airbnb. In 2007, let's go to the videotape here. It's clicker. What am I doing wrong? Sign no. This was, this was 2000, this is definitely <laughs> pre-2007 technology here. Yeah, thank you. Yes, the first one. Okay. There we go. Uh, this is a graph of the cost of sequencing a human genome. Uh, in 2001, it was $100 million, one genome. Uh, in 2006, it was 10 million. And in 2007, it goes over a cliff down to about $1,200. 
Solar power took off in 2007, as did a process for extracting natural gas from tight shale called fracking. Uh, this is a graph of social networks. Uh, that white line there, that's the cost of generating a megabit of data. Let's see, um, that started to fall in uh, 2007. Um, uh, the blue line is the cost of, the speed at which you could transmit it, megabit of data. It takes off, and the two lines cross in 2008. Close enough for government work. That's what Moore's Law looks like. Oh, I forgot. The cloud was also born in 2007. The cloud as we know it today. Um, in 2007, Intel for the first time went off silicon and introduced non-silicon materials into its transistors, extending Moore's Law's exponential for at least another decade. It turns out, friends, that 2007 was the single most important technological inflection point, maybe seen as the single most important technological inflection point since Gutenberg invented the printing press. And we completely missed it because of 2008. So right when our physical technologies just took off, like we're on a moving sidewalk at O'Hare that went from five miles an hour to 50 miles an hour, right when David Axelrod and Barack Obama were moving into the White House, our, our social technologies, what Eric Beinhacker calls our social technologies, the adaptation mechanisms, the regulation, deregulation, the political responses to this, many of them completely froze because of 2008. And we are still living in that dislocation. So as I laid this idea out, I was out visiting Astro Teller, who runs Google X, uh, Google's research arm. And uh, we were just talking about this, and Astro went over to his whiteboard, and he just drew this simple abstraction. Uh, I said, what's that? He said, well, this blue line is the average rate at which human beings and societies adapt to change over time. It has a positive slope, but as you can see, it's very gradual. Uh, this is technology. We'll call that Moore's Law, even though it didn't exist before. So we forget, if you lived in the 11th century or the 12th century, your life didn't change at all. We forget there was a time you lived a whole century, and your bow and arrow really didn't get much better. Uh, then we got Copernicus and Galileo, and then Intel and chips, and the line starts to take straight north. Then he drew that little diamond. I said, what's that? He said, we are here. We're now at a pace where technology is simply, at this exponential rate, growing faster than the average human being in society can adapt. Then he went over and drew this little gray dotted line. And I said, what's that? He said, that's politics. That's called learning faster and governing smarter. So we can lift the line of adaptation to begin to meet technology where it is. So what actually happened in 2007? What 2007 represents, in my view, is your little computer here, including your iPhone, um, actually is made of five key components. It's made of a processor, the Moore's Law um, uh, microprocessor. It's made of a storage chip. Uh, it's made of networking, it's made of software, and it's made of a sensor. Uh, it's got a camera, but sensors are now everywhere. What actually happened, I believe, is in the early 2000s, all of those were in a Moore's Law, and they all melded together in 2007 to create this thing we call the cloud. The cloud. But I never used the word the cloud in my book, because it sounds so fluffy. Sounds so soft, so cuddly, so benign. Sounds like a Joni Mitchell song. <laughs> I've looked at clouds from both. This ain't no cloud, folks. This is a supernova. The supernova is the largest force in nature. It's the explosion of a star. And I believe what all these melded into in 2007 was a giant release of energy into machines and people that changed four kinds of power in the early 21st century. Changed the power of one. Oh, what one person can do now? Are things we have never imagined before. We have a president-elect who can sit in his pajamas in his penthouse in New York 
and tweet to hundreds of millions of people directly without an editor, a libel lawyer, or a filter. Some would say without even a brain, okay? <laughs> um, but what's really new and really scary is the head of ISIS can do the exact same thing from Raqqa province in Syria. That's when you know the power of one has really changed. The power of machines have changed. Machines now have all five senses. We've never lived in an age of intelligent machines. I wrote about this last week. My teacher and friend, Dove Seidman, said Descartes, when the scientific revolution happened, said, I think, therefore I am. But what am I when machines can now think better than me? Well, we crossed that line on February 14, 2011, on, of all places, a game show. There were three contestants. Two were the all-time Jeopardy champions. The third simply went by his last name, Watson. Mr. Watson passed on the first question. But he jumped in on the second question, buzzed in before the two humans. The question was, it's worn on the foot of a horse and used by a dealer in a casino. And in under 2.5 seconds, Mr. Watson said in a perfect Jeopardy style, what is a shoe? And for the first time, a cognitive computer figured out a pun faster than two human beings. It's changed the power of ideas. Oh, ideas now flow, circulate, and change at a speed we've never seen before. Barack Obama, five years ago, said marriage is between a man and a woman. Today, blessedly so, he says marriage is between any two people who love each other, and he will follow Ireland in that position. Dylan Roof, this terrible man who shot up a black church in South Carolina. A week later, the Confederate flag, which had flown over the state house there for I don't know how many decades, it was gone, wiped out by Twitter and Facebook in a week. So we see ideas now changing and circulating at a speed we've never seen before. And lastly, it's changed the power of many. Because when machines and individuals get this amplified, we as a collective become the most important force in and on nature, which is why the new geophysical era is being named for us, the Anthropocene. Now, the argument of this book is that these four changes in power, they're not just changing the world. They are fundamentally reshaping the world. And they're reshaping five realms, politics, geopolitics, the workplace, ethics, and community. So since we're at the Institute of Politics, let me start there. How are these accelerations reshaping politics? Well, I believe we aren't just in the middle of one climate change right now. I believe we're in the middle of three climate changes at once. We're in the middle of a change in the climate of the climate. We're in the middle of the change in the climate of globalization. And we're in the middle of a change in the climate of technology. We're in the middle, actually, of three climate changes at once. What do you want when the climate changes? You want two things. You want resilience, because, boy, there's going to be disruptive things happening around you. And you want propulsion. You want to be able to move ahead. You don't want it to be curled up in a ball, because the climate's changing. So as I worked on the book, I sat down my, and I thought, who do I interview about how we build resilience and propulsion in citizens when the climate changes. Who do I interview? And then I realized I knew a woman. She was 3.8 billion years old. Her name was Mother Nature. And she'd been through more climate changes than anybody. So I called her up and I sat her down. And I interviewed her in the book. I said, Mother Nature, how do you produce resilience and propulsion when the climate changes? Because we are actually, we've actually built with our own hands today in globalization a complex adaptive system that the only thing it is comparable to in scope, scale, and complexity is actually the natural world. So I thought it'd be a good idea to start with Mother Nature. Oh, she said, uh, well, first of all, Tom, everything I do, I do unconsciously. Uh, but this is what I do. Uh, she said, first of all, I'm incredibly adaptive. In my world, only the adaptive survive. First rule of politics in Mother Nature. Uh, secondly, she said, I, 
I love diversity. Oh, I'm the most pluralistic person you've ever met. I try 20 different species, see who wins, and my most diverse ecosystems are my most resilient and propulsive ones. She said, I am incredibly sustainable. Uh, in my world, everything's circular, everything is food, eat food, poop seed, eat food, poop seed. I'm incredibly sustainable, there's no waste. For she said, I, I'm totally into entrepreneurship. Uh, wherever I see an opening in nature that's empty, I fill it with a plant or animal perfectly adapted to that niche. Fifth, she said, I'm very patient. You know, you can't speed up the gestation of an elephant or a 1,500-year-old baobab tree. Six, she said, I believe in co-evolution. There's nothing dogmatic about me. I believe in co, I put the right bees with the right flowers, the right trees with the right soil. I'm, I'm incredibly hybrid in my thinking. And lastly, she said, I do believe in the laws of bankruptcy. I kill all my failures. I return them to the great manufacturer in the sky, and I take their energy to nourish my successes. Well, the argument of my chapter is that the countries, companies, and communities that most closely mirror Mother Nature's killer apps will be the ones to thrive in the age of acceleration. And then just for fun, because we were in a political season, I imagine what would happen had Mother Nature been running in this election, okay? What would Mother Nature's political party look like to build resilience and propulsion? And the point here was not to be cute, but to be very serious. I believe all our parties are blowing up, and they're blowing up for a reason because they were essentially designed to respond to the New Deal, the Industrial Revolution, the early IT revolution, and civil rights, both gender and race. And I believe what politics has to be about today is how you respond to these three accelerations and how you get the most out of them for more of your people and cushion the worst. And I believe we're in a transition from one set of challenges to the other, and that this is what politics has to be about, so my party, is built entirely on that premise. I won't go into the details, but the basic thrust is my own politics. On some issues, I'm actually to the left of Bernie Sanders. Uh, I believe we should have single-payer health care. But at the same time, I am to the right of the Wall Street Journal editorial page. I believe we should abolish all corporate taxes and replace them with a carbon tax, a tax on bullets, a tax on sugar, and a small financial transaction tax. I believe to respond to these accelerations, we need to get radically entrepreneurial over here to pay for what we're going to need, stronger safety nets over here, because this world is going to get too damn fast for more people. And that politics has to be about those two. So my own thinking is we need to let things co-evolve. Unfortunately, in our politics today, if you're for radical entrepreneurship, you're never for safety nets. And if you're for safety nets, you're never for radical entrepreneurship. Uh, we do not let things co-evolve. And um, that is not sustainable, in my view. So um, that's how politics is going to, uh, I think, be reshaped in the age of acceleration. I'll talk a little about geopolitics, because again, we're here at this institute. So that chapter is called Control Versus Chaos or Order Versus Disorder. Now, I am an old fart. I'm 63 years old. Uh, when I grew up, there was a great sitcom called Get Smart. It was a spoof of James Bond. And Don Adams had a shoe phone. Um, he was Agent 99. His partner was Agent 86. I'm going to test you here. Uh, Axe can't answer. Who can remember? the name of the organization that Don Adams worked for. See, it was called? Chaos. No, Control. Control. Thank you. This is a good audience. <laughs> it was called Control. Their worldwide enemy was called Chaos, spelled K-A-O-S. Well, I believe the writers of that show were ahead of their time, because I believe the relevant geopolitical divide in the world today is no longer communist, capitalist, east, west, north, south. It's between the world of control and the world of chaos. That is the relevant geopolitical divide. And right now, the Mediterranean and the Rio Grande 
are the two major dividing lines. Why is this happening? Basically, it's happening because we went through a period in the last century as we moved from empires to nation states, where after World War I and World War II, we birthed 190 plus nation states. And the Cold War, the Cold War was a fantastic time to be a weak little state. It was great. Why? There were two superpowers, first of all, who were ready to throw money at you, foreign aid, build your stadium, rebuild your army. If you're Syria, you could lose three wars to Israel, get your army rebuilt. Climate change was moderate. Everyone had a demographic dividend, lots of young people, few old people. And China was not in the World Trade Organization. So it couldn't take your low wage labor. So everybody could start with textiles. It was a fantastic time to be a weak little state. Get your kids educated at Patrice Lumumba University in Moscow or University of Chicago. Fantastic time to be a weak little state. The age of acceleration has obliterated all of those advantages. Now, there's no superpowers, unless you're Syria, and that's a freak case, who want to throw any money at you. Donald Trump may abolish AID. The superpowers know all they win is a bill. There's no more global competition in that way. Climate change is now hammering everybody. Many countries now have huge demographic deficits. And China is in the World Trade Organization. So if you are thinking of starting your people in the textile business, I suggest you think again. I tell the story. I was in Egypt for Tahrir Square Revolution, gone from my wife for three weeks covering the revolution. Revolution was over. I went to Cairo Airport, fly home, see my honey. I'm in Cairo Airport. And they've got the treasures of Egypt souvenir shop. I thought I'd go in and buy my honey a little souvenir to remind her where her honey was for three weeks. Let's see, what do they have here? Pyramids, ashtrays. Oh, my, my honey doesn't smoke. Oh, what's this? It's a stuffed camel. And if you squeeze its hump, it honks. My honey doesn't have a honking hump camel. I take it to the cash register, turn it over. What does it say? Made in China. Yeah, you're the lowest wage country in the Eastern Mediterranean. And there's now a country a half a world away can make your pyramids ashtray or honking humped camel cheaper than you can and ship it and make a profit. Basically, what's happening is all these states, in my view, are going to fall apart. And the ones that are going to go first are those whose borders are primarily straight lines, because they're the most artificial. They are like caravan homes in a trailer park with no basement and no foundation. And my three accelerations are like a tornado. And what you are seeing today, from West Africa to the border of India, is a tornado going through a trailer park. We took down some of them. Others are doing very well at taking themselves down. And it is creating a vast zone of disorder. Now, in centuries past, an empire would come in and occupy this zone. But as I said today, the would-be empires of the world don't want to touch it. So we have never lived in a world where you have vast zones of disorder, where no empire wants to assert control and where individuals are getting super empowered in an interdependent world. So if Rex Tillerson is not affirmed as Secretary of State, and Donald Trump calls any of you and says, I'd like you to be Secretary of State, my advice is tell him you had your heart set on agriculture, OK? <laughs> because I think being Secretary of State in a world of order versus disorder is going to be hell on wheels. It is the most impossible job today in the world because it's all about managing weakness. And for so many years, being Secretary of State was all about managing strength. And there is nothing harder than managing weakness. Let me say uh, a few words about ethics, and then we'll conclude and go to the questions. Ethics. Why would ethics be 
uh, an issue that's being reshaped. Well, my chapter on that in the book is called, Is God in Cyberspace? Comes from the best question I ever got on book tour, Portland, Oregon, 1999. I'm selling a book called Lexus and the Olive Tree at the Portland Theater. Young man stands up in the balcony and says, Mr. Friedman, I have a qu qu question. Is God in cyberspace? I said, ah, 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 I said, ah, I, said, I, I, I have no idea. I, I felt like a complete idiot. So I went home and I called my spiritual teacher. He's a rabbi. C. Marks. I met him at the Hartman Institute when I was a New York Times correspondent in Jerusalem. He lives in Amsterdam now, married to a Dutch priest, very interesting character, great Talmudist. I called him. I said, Svi, I got a question I've never had before. Is God in cyberspace? What should I have said? And he said, well, Tom, in our faith tradition, we have two concepts of the Almighty. One is biblical, one's post-biblical. The biblical concept is that the Almighty is almighty. He smites evil and rewards good. And if that's your view of God, he sure isn't in cyberspace, which is full of pornography, gambling, cheating, lying, vast criminality, and we now know fake news. Okay. <laughs> but he said, fortunately, we have a post-biblical view of God that says God manifests himself by how we behave. So if we want God to be in cyberspace, we have to bring him there by how we behave there. Well, I liked Svi's answer. I threw it into the paperback edition of Lexus and the Olive Tree, where none of you saw it, and I forgot about it for 20 years. I started writing this book, and I found myself spontaneously retelling that story. And I finally sat myself down and said, why are you retelling that story now? And the answer was twofold and became immediately clear to me. It's because we have never been more godlike and because we have never lived in a realm more God-free. What do I mean? We are now living our lives, and I believe 2016 will be remembered as the tipping point. We are now living so much of our lives in cyberspace. It's where we educate, it's where we communicate, it's where we find our next date, it's where we find our spouse, it's where we do our business, it's where we get our news, it's where we produce our news. We're living in cyberspace now. So many hours of the day, there's just one problem. Cyberspace is a realm where we're all connected, but no one's in charge. We've, there are no stoplights in cyberspace, no judges, no courts, no 1-800-please-stop-Putin from hacking my election. But yet, that's where we're now living our lives. We're living our lives in a realm that is completely, not only God-free, but law-free and basically rule-free. And all you have to do is be a public figure and be slimed in cyberspace to know how there are no rules and there's no one to call. At the same time, we're living in a world of amplified human and machine power. Now you put those two together and what do you start to realize? You start to realize we're at a moral intersection we've never stood at before. In 1945, we entered a world where one country could kill all of us, post Hiroshima. If it had to be one country, I'm glad it was mine. I think we're entering a world where one person can kill all of us and where all of us could actually fix everything. The same amplified powers are creating a world where one of us can kill all of us and all of us could actually feed, house, clothe, and educate if we put our minds to it every person on the planet. We have never been to this intersection before where one of us could kill all of us and all of us could fix everything. What does that mean? It means we've never been more godlike as a species than we are today, and we've never spent more hours in a realm that is completely God-free. And that is going to be a huge moral and ethical dilemma. How do we deal with it? Well, you know, I gave this uh, part of my talk as the commencement address at Olin College of Engineering in Massachusetts last May. And I said to the parents, I know what you're thinking, just like I know what you're thinking. I said to them, you paid 200 grand so your kid could get an engineering degree. And they brought in a knucklehead commencement speaker who's preaching what? The golden rule. 
If we don't scale the golden rule, do unto others as you wish them to do unto you, or whatever version your faith has, and every faith has a version, oh, we're going to have a real problem. Because we now live in a world where more people can do unto you from farther away than ever before. Putin just did unto us in a way that no country has ever done in our history. And we can now do unto him the same way. If we don't scale the golden rule, we're in for a real problem. And as I said to those parents, and I'll say to you, I know what you're thinking. Is there anything more naive? Is there anything more naive? Oh, there is. Because what's really naive is thinking we're going to be OK in a world of this much amplified power, where we now spend this much time in a realm where we're all connected and no one's in charge, if we don't scale the golden rule. Now that's naive. And the theme of this chapter is naivete is the new realism. So where does the golden rule come from? Well, I think it comes from two places, primarily. Strong families and healthy communities. Now, I'm not an expert on strong families. I hope I built one and lived in one, but I wouldn't presume to lecture anyone on that subject. But I am an expert on healthy communities, because I grew up in one. I, and the book ends with the last two chapters about the little town in Minnesota where I grew up called St. Louis Park. Uh, very briefly, um, in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, that's outside of Minneapolis, um, all the Jews um, lived in a ghetto in the north side uh, in the 40s and 50s with African Americans, not because we had integration, but because we were both forced there. And um, Minneapolis was known as the capital of anti-Semitism. My parents couldn't join AAA, for instance, um, until Hubert Humphrey became mayor and cleared it out of city government, big hero in our house. After the war, in the mid-50s, I was born in 53, all the Jews, almost all the Jews, move en masse in a three-year period out of the north side of Minneapolis to one town, one suburb really, called St. Louis Park. Overnight, a suburb that was 100% Protestant, Catholic, and Scandinavian became 20% Jewish, 80% Protestant, Catholic, and Scandinavian. If Sweden and Israel had a baby, it would be St. Louis Park, OK? <laughs> and you had this incredible experiment in pluralism and inclusion. We, the Jews of the frozen tundra, who called ourselves the frozen chosen, um, <laughs> uh, melded with these incredibly pluralistic and decent Swedes. And we built a pretty interesting and inclusive community, not without pain, not without broken hearts and broken friendships. But we built a pretty interesting community, because I actually went to high school, lived in the same neighborhood with, or went to Hebrew school with the Cone brothers, Al Franken, Norm Ornstein, Michael Sandel, Peggy Ornstein, Sharon Isbin, the guitarist, Alan Wiseman, who wrote us, um, The World Without Us, the Hauptman brothers, who won the National Book Award. We all grew up in the same basic neighborhood at the same time. The Cone brothers movie, A Serious Man, was about our neighborhood. If you watch No Country for Old Men, and remember the scene where Churga blows up a car outside of a pharmacy in Mexico so he can go in and steal drugs. The camera briefly pans to the name of the pharmacy. It's called Mike Zoss Drugs. That was the main pharmacy in St. Louis Park. So I actually saw a really interesting community get built. And I saw how it happened. Two things reinforcing each other. Great leadership and trust. The better the leadership, the more the trust. The more the trust, the better the leadership. You come to St. Louis Park today, it's indistinguishable from Hopkins, Edina, Minnetonka, and Golden Valley. There's no moat around it. There's no drawbridge, no wall. But the culture is incredibly powerful. And it's all about this ability to build trust, my friend. And teacher Dove Seidman likes to say, trust is the only legal performance enhancing drug. Where there's trust in the room, oh, it's like a hard floor, you can jump so high. Where there's no trust, it's like sand. You can't jump a millimeter. I tell that story, and then the book ends, because I come back 40 years later. I left St. Louis Park in 1971 to discover the world, and I came back 40 years later and found the world had discovered St. Louis Park. 
Nama High School is 50% white, Protestant, Catholic, Scandinavian, 10% Jewish, 10% Hispanic, and 30% Somali and African American, mostly Somali. Because the same neighborhood, little town that was ready to take the Jews took the Somalis. Now the inclusion challenge is so much more profound. The bridges that have to be built to span racial and religious divides much longer. And I tell the story about how they're doing. And they're doing pretty well. It's a struggle. I make no predictions. But my high school's rated by the Washington Post, the fifth best high school in Minnesota, with a totally different demographic. And I tell also the story of Minneapolis and what's going on there. Don't know how it's going to come out, but I am struck at the number of people who want to get caught trying. And I'd like to quote my teacher and friend, Avery Lovins, a great physicist, who, whenever he's asked, are you an optimist or a pessimist, always answers, I'm neither. They're just two different forms of fatalism. Everything will be great. Everything will be awful. Amory's motto is, I believe in applied hope. And what strikes me about my little town um, and the politics of Minneapolis right now is the number of people ready to apply hope. If you want to be an optimist about this country, stand on your head. It, the politics looks so much better from the bottom up than from the top down. Because there are a lot of healthy communities. There's a lot of struggling communities. But there's an amazing amount of social innovation going on in the country, so much so that I would tell you nothing has to be invented. Whatever you can imagine, somebody's already doing it. It just has to be found and scaled and shared. So I'll end here with my book as a theme song. Uh, I thought of, could I buy it? And um, when you opened the book, you would play this song like a Hallmark card plays Happy Birthday. Uh, the song is by Brandi Carlisle, one of my favorite uh, singers. She's a country folk singer, if you don't know. And her song is called The I, E-Y-E. And the main refrain is, I wrapped your love around me like a chain, but I never was afraid that it would die. You can dance in a hurricane, but only if you're standing in the eye. And I think my three accelerations, they are like a hurricane. I think Donald Trump is selling us a wall. And I think there are politicians all over the world today who are in the wall business. I'm arguing for an eye. An eye that moves with the storm, draws energy from it, but creates a platform of dynamic stability in it. The healthy community where people can feel connected, protected, and, res <laughs> and respected. Connected, protected, and respected. I think the struggle of politics in the next few years, at least, across the industrialized world is going to be between the wall people and the eye people. And my book is a manifesto for the eye people. Thank you very much. Yeah. Someone right up here. Thanks so much for being with us. My name is Matt Enloe, and I'm a second year student at the law school. Mm -hmm. uh, the world is certainly accelerating, and like you say, I think safety nets for preserving or creating healthy communities will be more important than ever. So my question is about one possible approach to this, a way in which all of us might save everything. Would you predict the widespread adoption, domestic and abroad, of policies like a universal mm. basic income to address mm -hmm. poverty and stagnant wages, given the decoupling of production from wages in the past few decades? Mm -hmm. Very, very good question. Um, so I'm actually against UBI, um, uh, uh, for not for economic reasons. I, I'm, I, uh, in my politics, my mother nature's political party, I'm for uh, doing what President Obama tried to do, which is vastly expanding the earned income tax credit. I think the dignity and the anchoring and the sense of self-worth that come and purpose that comes from work is so important that what we should be doing is encouraging people to work and then top up their wages to narrow income gaps. But the idea of paying people to stay home, um, I, think that, 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 uh, I think that could be socially very corrosive. Uh, we'll go all the way back, and then we'll come up. Yeah. Mr. Freeman, thank you for coming to chat with us today. Thank you. Um, in my native Michigan, towns and cities across it, and people are being ravaged. Um, that's one reason that people change their voting habits, as you sure. know, this cycle. And Charlie Cook's political report recently reported that uh, medical technology and green energy jobs are not going to be adequate 
to address the economic mm. structural changes in our yeah. country. So what advice would you offer yeah. to people across Michigan in light of disappearing jobs and the difficulty in replacing their economic means mm. in your framework? Yeah, very good question. So um, uh, I deal with this, uh, I have a chapter on how the workplace is being reshaped. It's called How We Turn AI into IA, How We Turn Artificial Intelligence into Intelligent Assistance, A-N-C-E, Intelligent Assistance, A-N-T-S, and intelligent algorithms, and I address some of what you're asking right there. Um, uh, you know, there's there's no uh, question. We have pockets in the country, and especially in the industrial heartlands, that um, uh, where people have been been ravaged. Um, so I did a column last week uh, about this subject. It was called uh, again. I did it with my friend Dove Seidman. Uh, it was called "From Hands to Heads to Hearts." I'm going to give you a general answer because I can't give you a specific answer for every town. Um, and the basic argument was that um, uh, for many years we worked with our hands. Um, and 98% uh, uh, of us were once farmers, worked on the land. Um, then when industry came, we worked uh, in services, we worked with our heads. Um, a lot of us worked in services and knowledge. And, and, and uh, the argument Dove and I put forward is that um, in the next generation we'll work with our hearts. That um, uh, it will be jobs of the heart um, that uh, uh, the one thing machines don't have and can never have. And so, um, uh, and I'm not in any way minimizing, if I'm a 50-year-old guy who's lost my manufacturing job and I come, Friedman comes to town and says, you're gonna work with your heart, I, I, I get it, we, 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 uh, we have a challenge there. Um, that's why we're gonna have to have stronger safety nets because a lot of people are gonna be caught in, in this transition. But um, what, what am I actually saying? So I really, for me, one of the most interesting interviews in the book I did was with our Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy, amazing guy, Indian American. And um, Vivek, we were talking about what's the biggest disease in America today. Is it heart disease? Is it diabetes? Is it cancer? And Vivek said it's none of those. It's isolation. The Surgeon General of the United States says the biggest disease in America today is people feeling isolated. Isn't that interesting? We're in the most connected era in world history. And the Surgeon General says the biggest problem he has is isolation. So what that tells me is there's sure going to be a lot of jobs connecting hearts. OK. And you know, uh, as the Talmudic adage says, what comes from the heart enters the heart. What doesn't come from the heart can't enter the heart. And so I think there's going to be a huge explosion of work around connecting people. The example I give is, um, uh, and this is not to trivialize your, your question, but the fastest growing restaurant chain in America, chain in, America in 2015 was called Paint Night. Uh, it's uh, paint by numbers classes for adults in bars. Okay. Uh, our teachers make $50,000 a year for three hours work five nights a week. Because adults, it turns out, hey, I would like to get together and paint by numbers together uh, with other adults. And I use that simply as a small example that I think there's just going to be a huge industry around connecting people to people. And um, I think it's going to take many, many different forms. On the other side, there's going to be a whole set of jobs as a result of these accelerations that you can't possibly imagine. Um, I was at a conference in, in September, and a woman stood up and said her job was tagging sharks for Twitter. And I thought, geez, your kid comes home from college, says, Mom, Dad, I want to tag sharks for Twitter when I grow up. Yeah. What, 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 you, you couldn't be an ophthalmologist. You have to tag sharks for Twitter. Um, uh, like, who knew there was a job tagging sharks for Twitter? OK. The point is, you know, if horses could have voted, there never would have been cars. And, um, uh, and so in a period of rapid change, there's always somebody, there's going to be a state that's going to be really disadvantaged. All right, There's no question about it. Um, and we, that's why I say we've got to have these safe nets, we've got to figure it out. So I don't have a specific answer for everyone in Michigan. But my general answer is this, and it's completely the opposite of where Donald Trump wants to go. I think in a period of rapid change, you actually want to be radically open. I want TPP everywhere, actually. Because the most open society is going to get the signals first, and it's going to attract the most high IQ risk takers to start new jobs. Um, you want to be radically open, you want to educate everybody as much as you can, and you want to strengthen your safety nets, because it will be too fast for too many people, for a lot of people. If you close off, uh, if you actually close us up, you will be doing the most dangerous thing you could do to America right now. 
Um, so I don't have a specific answer for everyone in Michigan because I don't know um, the amazing things that people are doing, like tagging sharks for Twitter and making a really good living from it. Um, all I know is generally what I would do in a moment of transition like this is be radically open and, and trust human creativity. If, if I were running, and this is part of my platform, um, I, would have run on four, I would have run on four zeros. Uh, I would be for zero emission uh, cars, zero carbon uh, power, uh, zero waste manufacturing, and uh, zero um, uh, energy buildings. In other words, I would see what is, what is Rex Tillerson said something yesterday. He's going to get a column for this. Um, uh, that was <laughs> the most dangerous thing he said, but it was just it's sotto voce. He said, um, "Yeah, we should hold on to the Paris Agreement um, uh, for now, but we want to make sure it isn't disadvantaging our companies." Well, which companies? Solar companies, efficiency companies, uh, wind companies. Um, have you ever, I don't, I, I got to include this graph, but think about this graph for a minute. I'll do it visually for you because it applies to Michigan. Because I was at war with the Michigan delegation, uh, congressional delegation, um, uh, including um, Mr. Dingell, uh, who I think, um, I do not think highly of. Uh, because 1973, I'll try to do this graph for you. We have the oil crisis. And 1975, Gerald Ford comes in and he doubles mileage standards from 12 to 24 miles per hour, roughly. So think of the graph goes like that mileage standard. Reagan then comes in, stops it, and for the next 25 years, mileage standards stay flat. We tell our auto companies to really focus on making better cup holders rather than better engines. For 25 years, it stays totally flat. And in those 25 years, we send a trillion dollars to petro dictators around the world. Then Barack Obama comes in, 2008, and he doubles it from 25 to 50. Now, what is Trump telling the auto companies? Just hang on till January 20, and I'm going to stop what Obama did. Is there anything more stupid? And by the way, I hate to tell you, I don't mean to insult Michiganders, a lot of people in Michigan are going to applaud for that. And it was precisely in that flat line there that Toyota uh, and Nissan killed the auto industry. To me, the Michigan delegation, it was appropriate that Dr. Kevorkian came from Michigan because they were essentially involved in the assisted suicide of the US auto industry. Imagine if that line that Ford started, we had taken straight up. I bet you anything, the jobs in Michigan would not have gone away. And so I, I have sympathy, but um, at the same time, we got to think about what world we're living in, you know? And if you listen to Trump, who is really stupid, I mean, he's, he's like, he's like you, you can't underestimate how little this guy knows and how much he has nothing but a first paragraph. He, he won the presidency with one paragraph. He couldn't sustain any argument more than one paragraph. Unfortunately, Hillary only had a second paragraph. And it didn't have a topic sentence. And that's why she lost, OK? But what he is doing, these little things you have to pay attention the long-term consequences of taking Jerry Ford's line like that and then flattening it out for 30 years, that's why Michigan's where it's at. So please, I'm not saying to you, but I'm saying in general to, to these people from out there who say, what are you going to do? Well, you made some really bad choices that some of us were arguing against for a long time. And now you say, let's close down everything. Well, wait a minute. You, know, you want to close now, off, choke all of us. Trump is actually talking about eliminating H-1B visas. And I'll tell you what will happen there. First, uh, that's the Full Employment for India Act. Let's start there, OK? Um, but what will happen is Microsoft tomorrow will do what it did the first time they tried that, open it in its next research center in Vancouver. So we're in a, we're in a flow of, you know, you know Trump saying, I saved these 800 jobs at Carrier, whatever he did. What he doesn't see is every CEO of an industry in America right now is saying, we are never going to build another plant here again. Because I don't want to be stuck exposed to this guy, you know? and automate everything you can. I don't want any workers, because then Trump can't get me. 
So he's holding up this, and meanwhile, over here, there's a million other decisions. Actually, this is a good column. I'm writing a column now. Just all the stupid, <laughs> this is how columns appear. Um, it's just like, just a list of this guy doesn't see around any corner. We're going to fight with Putin against ISIS. Really? Really? Let's see, who are Putin's uh, uh, allies in this fight? Hezbollah, Iran, and a group of mercenary jihadists from Central Asia. We're going to be in a trench with them? So there, there isn't a corner this guy has looked around. There isn't a second paragraph he's ever read. Sorry for the rant, but that's where I answer. Yeah. So a question from Wisconsin. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Go over here, right here. Yeah. <laughs> this will be much different. <laughs> to Please. So the point I have is this, that you're talking about, so what, what I think you missed about Mother Nature is that, that Mother Nature is very gradualist. Yes. That it changes Absolutely, really yeah. slowly. Yes. But what you are saying, what you're advocating is radical change. So when we have a time where these radical changes are happening, where mm -hmm. every trust that government right. is at its lowest point, how do you get your kind of eye politicians to power? Because mm -hmm. even if what you say is 100% right. correct, right. like, Mind my skepticism, I'm from Turkey, so yes, it, I there, there's reasons to be <laughs> skeptical. Yes, yeah, sure. How are your eye politicians going to win? Because yes. that's where I see yeah. the most problem lies. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, very good question. Next question back there, please. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, it's a very good question, and I'll, 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 I frankly, you know, I, on one hand, I, I despair over it. Um, uh, I really do. Um, but. Show me someone who's actually tried my platform. Because Hillary Clinton didn't. I said she only had a second paragraph and it had no topic sentence. You know? And so I actually still believe, if you can package it the right way, and Ax may disagree with this, but that if you actually take these people on, I think the challenge for Democrats you know, now going forward, um, so the, I, you know, I spent a lot of time covering the Middle East. Um, and. Uh, uh, my friend Leon Wieseltier once coined um, a phrase to describe Yitzhak Rabin, and he called him a bastard for peace. What Democrats today need is a bastard for peace. They need someone who can connect up at the gut level with people where they are, but still have a progressive agenda. It's a very, you know, rare balance. You know, but Rabin had it, Sharon had it. You know, because I'm a firm believer, people do not listen through their ears. They listen through their stomach. And if you connect what Trump did in a phony, utterly phony way, this plutocrat, fraudulent, you know, marketer basically, presented himself as the man of the people. Somehow he connected at a gut level, and that's why he could say the same thing Erdogan says. Erdogan says exactly what Trump says. I could shoot someone on the Sultan Ahmed Bridge, okay, in, in the middle of the day, and no one would testify against me. When you've got that zone, then you've arrived. Who's got it today? Bibi's got it. Trump has it. Erdogan has it. Putin has it. They've all found this gut connection to people, because it's basically cultural. It's about humiliation, and that they present themselves as the anti-humiliation people. If Democrats don't find that, that person, they're going to get steamrolled. And you marry that then with my agenda. Because see, when you connect with people at the gut level, you know what they tell you? Don't bother me with the details. I trust you. And when you don't connect with them on a gut level, Hillary, could you show me those details one more time? Could you show me paragraph five again? I got to read that again for the 14th time. So um, that to me is a challenge for progressives. Um, but it, it, and that's why when I write about Trump, and I try not to write about him a lot, because he can actually take your brains out. You know, he'll just, um, <laughs> if you write about him every day, so you won't start, you won't write this book, you won't be thinking about the world. The worst thing, from my point of view, you can say to Trump is, you're bad, you're a bad guy. Oh my God, he loves that. The liberal New York Times says I'm bad. What I say about him is you're a chump. In fact, you're everybody's chump. You're Bibi's chump. You're Putin's chump. You're Big Oil's chump. You think you're a tough guy. You're actually everybody's sucker. That drives him crazy. Because he thinks we're all his chump. 
So you really got to think very smartly about how these guys are winning. And they're playing off cultural humiliation of large groups of people. They're connecting up with it and then using it to advance the oil companies. It's a, it's a terribly cynical play. And in four years, I trust me, Trump's voters will not be better off. But Democrats have to break into that. And um, if you do it the traditional way that we just weren't left enough, trust me, you're going to get steamrolled. Yeah, take a couple more. Yeah, please. So when John Brennan was here last week and he was discussing the role of Russia in the recent election, yeah. he mentioned that people are uncomfortable with the idea that a government might have to intervene in the internet the same way that the United States government does in airports, for example, with right. the TSA. Yeah. And so you discussed this godlike nature on the internet. Yeah, God free. Right, everyone. yeah. And to what extent do you believe that a government or a, you know, a body of government right. will be able to regulate the internet, which has, you know, which sure. people have a real issue Right, with. yeah. I, I don't have an answer. It's a very good question. I don't have an answer. I, I think we need some kind of new social compact, but I don't know what it is. And I, I'm, I'm truly stumped. All, all I can now is describe the problem. We're sort of early in on it, relatively, but I think... For the IOP, you want to study the next great political science challenge? That's it. You know, um, because if all our lives are moving to a realm that's basically God-free and law-free, what does that mean for politics? And what does it mean for governance? You know, we know about terrestrial governance, but cyber governance can be so much harder. So it's a very important question. Yeah, take this. And, yeah. You're, you're this, this ra you're calling for this radical change in our relationships with each other to become more open and more trusting and more entrepreneurial. I'm wondering if there are any examples in history that we can look to for guidance. Um, it's a very, very good question. I'd have to think about it. Um, I'm not enough of a historian to, to answer your question. You know, has there been a period like this? And it'd be interesting to look at the early Industrial Revolution and that transition moment, because we're in one of these transition moments, you know. We're at that moment when horses and buggies are still on the street, but new cars are just being phased in, you know, and um, I, I, I don't know, but it's a very good question. Another good PhD thesis at the IOP. Um, <laughs> take one more back there, yeah. So I asked a question uh, last week. Uh, to Sean Spicer. He didn't give me a very satisfactory mm. answer. I think you're the perfect person to address this issue. Great. I I talk about uh, Trump using his uh, Twitter or social media platform as a way to shape his foreign policy message. Uh, with this way of addressing to American people uh, derail or even debate some serious foreign policy uh, discussion in the first place, or it would be a flatter foreign policy discussion landscape yes, in a I positive agree. sense? Yeah, a good, a good, another good question. Um, you know, one of the things I always respected about President Obama was that um, whether I agreed with where he came out on an issue or not, like Syria or whatever, but he, he um, I, I was actually, I'll back up and say that um, uh, the new uh, second edition of An Inconvenient Truth is coming out, Al Gore's movie. And the uh, Paramount people asked me if I would you know, look at it and maybe write about it. And I said I would. I was talking to my friend Hal Harvey, who actually went here. Um, uh, he's a great energy entrepreneur. I said I'm going to do, maybe I'll write something about An Inconvenient Truth. And uh, he sat back and he said, you know, Tom, the most inconvenient truth is that the world's a complicated place. That's the most inconvenient truth. And I, I'm actually thinking of doing Al Gore's movie, The Day of the Inauguration, as my column. Because you can tweet whatever you want. But you know, my uh, teacher and friend, Rob Watson, a great environmentalist, you know, likes to say that um, Mother Nature, she's just chemistry, biology, and physics. That's all she is. You can't talk her up, you can't talk her down, you can't tweet at her. She's going to do whatever chemistry, biology, and physics dictate. And Mother Nature always bats last. And she always bats a 1,000. Do not mess with Mother Nature. And that's what Trump is doing. So you can tweet about that all you like. But at the end of the day, these big forces, um, unless you approach them as Obama tried to in a really 
complicated way where what does the politics allow me and maybe I can double mileage standards don't talk about it a lot you know that's how he moved the ball in a complex world and if you just come in and tweet at me and tweet this and tweet that in a world of these accelerations they will blow you down and I think the most dangerous point for America is the day Donald Trump really meets resistance because he's going to get really ugly then and when the President of the United States goes ugly, we've never experienced this kind of deformed character with these kind of tools. Um, I, I, I really worry about that day. I think we have done the most um, reckless thing we have ever done as a country. Period, paragraph, end it. And on that happy note, <laughs> it's right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.